Welcome to episode 25 of Real Health Radio. You can find the show notes and the links talked about in this episode at www.7-health.com forward slash 25. So that's www7 spelt out, so S-E-V-E-N hyphen health.com forward slash 25. Welcome to Real Health Radio. Health advice that's more than just about how you look. And here's your host, Chris Sandel. Hey everybody, welcome to Real Health Radio. Uh, This is going to be another episode where it's me just riffing on a specific topic myself. Um, But before I launch into that, I just want to mention that I'm currently in the process of taking on new clients. I take on clients uh, twice a year, so once at the start of the year and once in the midpoint, and I'm doing that at the moment. I opened up a couple of weeks ago, and I'm already about halfway full. So I work with clients for a period of five months where we have a consult for an hour every two weeks. I have clients all over the world, and consults are done via Skype. Um, It can be done via FaceTime or phone if people prefer So if you're not based in the UK, this isn't a problem. More than half the people I work with are based in Australia or Canada or the US or Germany or other places around Europe or around the world. And if working with me appeals to you, then the the first step or the start of this is by us having a free initial chat. And this allows me to find out more about what you want help with and what you're wanting to get out of us working together. And it gives me the opportunity to explain how I work with clients and how the process works. And basically, it lets us see if we're the right fit for one another. And I only want to work with people I truly believe that I can help and people who are on the same page. And this chat allows us to work out if this is the case. So if you're interested in finding out more, then head over to www.7seven-health.com forward slash help, and there's going to be more details there. And if you're interested after reading that page, then click on the link um, that's at the bottom that says apply to have a free chat, and I'll get back to you within 48 hours, and we can arrange a time that works for both of us. So if you're wanting to start 2016 with some help in regards to your health or nutrition or body image or food issues, then go over to www.seven-health.com forward slash help and get in contact. So with that out of the way, let's get started on today's show. And This episode is all about a woman's cycle and specifically looking at why a woman can have problems with it. And when I say problems with it, I mean that cycles are too short or they're too long or periods are being irregular or periods are not sort of showing up at all. Um, It can also include different symptoms that a woman's getting leading up to her period or during her period or at really any point during the cycle. And there's 13 real major reasons that I want to go through as part of this podcast. And often people can have issues because of multiple reasons and and a number of these different reasons I'm going to go through rather than it just being one. And this list is by no means exhaustive. There are undoubtedly going to be ideas that I have missed out on, but I feel that this is probably a pretty strong starting place for you to start thinking about things if you are having issues. So let's start with the first reason, which is stress. And when I think of issues with a woman's cycle, the first thing I think of is really stress. And when most people hear the word stress, they think about things like uh, working long hours at work, being in an unhappy relationship, not being able to pay the mortgage or the rent or the death of a friend or a family member or moving house, like normally big and obvious stresses. But really, this is a rather narrow way of looking at what stress is. And stress is much more pervasive than just these uh, big events. And from my experience of working with clients, it's normally the small day-to-day stresses that are slowly chipping away at their health. So let me define what I mean by the word stress. Stress is any physical, mental, or emotional factor that causes the body to make an adaption. The body is always trying to keep itself in a state of homeostasis. And a stressor is really something that pushes the body out of that normal range and causes the body to make changes to bring it back to where it should be, or at least to attempt to bring it back to where it should be. 
And stress is a real normal part of everyday life and there is no way that it can be avoided and you shouldn't be trying to avoid it. But what you're wanting to do is to be giving the body what it needs to be able to mediate the stress so it's able to make the adaptions that are being asked for. And stress when it starts to cause a problem is when you're having 10 or 20 things that are all asking for energy and all asking for adaptions, but you're not providing the body with what it needs to do this. And this is when stress then causes a problem. So in a general sense, whenever I first start seeing someone with issues to do with their cycles, stress is the thing that I think of first and foremost. And the survival order within the body is safety and security first, then sustenance, meaning food, and then sex or procreation. So unless your body feels safe and secure, then your body puts a lot of its other jobs on hold. And when I say safe and secure, I mean physically, mentally, and emotionally. Its primary focus is getting you out of harm's way and it will put its efforts and resources into achieving this goal above all else. So when your body is under stress, it pulls the blood away from your digestive system, from your reproductive system, and historically stress was about fight and flight. You were being chased by a lion or you were chasing a lion. If there was an argument between tribes, they would go to war with each other. And while we become more civilized, the mechanisms for stress are still based on how we evolved over millions of years. So if someone is working long hours, they aren't getting much sleep, they're having long gaps between their meals and they're not eating enough, all of which are stresses in the body, then the body is then going to be spending its focus on getting the body out of harm's way rather than looking at things like libido or procreation. And the other way of looking at this with stress is stress is really about energy regulation. And lots of nutritionists talk about balancing blood sugars, and you may have heard this term before, and managing the stress response is largely responsible for this. So whenever there is stress, and whatever that stress may be, the body wants to deal with it by bringing energy to the situation. So you go too long between a meals, you then turn on stress hormones to bring energy to your cells to try and fix that situation. Same thing happens if you're running for a line, or you realize you sent an email that you shouldn't, or you see guys approaching you on a dark street. All these create the exact same response of increasing stress hormones that, amongst other things, are trying to bring energy to your cells to deal with that situation. And one of the easiest ways of getting that energy in that time of stress is by diverting it from long-term health and instead just focusing on using stuff to get out of harm's way. And reproduction is not very high on our list of priorities when you're running from a real or proverbial line. So it halts or severely minimizes the energy that it's giving to the reproductive system and uses it to get out of harm's way or uses it for more of the short-term things that it thinks is more important. And this also makes sense when you think about sex and procreation, not just like the hormonal cycle. Like the act of sex uses up calories. I mean, how many will vary depending on what you're getting up to and for how long. Uh, but the real energy drain for a woman comes if she actually gets pregnant. So the average pregnancy costs the body 50,000 calories and breastfeeding costs about 1,000 calories a day. And at some level, your body knows about these requirements and it avoids it if there's not enough energy to start with or it thinks that it's in an insecure um, situation where that energy could be potentially uh, disappearing. So despite the kind of doom and gloom I'm praying with stress, um, it is amazing how hearty the body can really be. And I want to share an excerpt from the book uh, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers by Robert Sapowski. Uh, it's one of my favorite books of all time and is one of my go-to resources for all things stress. So he talks about in this book a study that was done on women in Nazi concentration camps conducted by Nazi doctors. And in a study of women in the three and Verensdast concentration camp. I know I've absolutely butchered that that name. Um, the name of the concentration camp doesn't really matter. But when they did a study of women in a particular concentration camp, 54% uh, of the reproductive age women were found to have stopped menstruating. 
And this isn't really surprising. Uh, starvation, slave labor, unspeakable psychological terror are all going to disrupt reproduction. But of the women who stopped menstruating, the majority stopped within the first month in the camps. So before starvation and labor had pushed fat levels down to that decisive point. So many researchers will then cite this as a demonstration of just how uh, disruptive even psychological stress can be on reproduction. But the surprising fact is really the opposite of that, that despite salvation, exhausting labor, and the daily terror that, say, each day could be your last, only 54% of those women cease menstruation. So reproductive mechanisms were still working in nearly half the women. And undoubtedly, certain numbers of these were probably having inovulatory cycles, which means they were menstruating, but they weren't actually ovulating. But still, that reproductive physiology still operated in an individual who was under just the most intense of circumstances, and that is absolutely extraordinary. So stress is one form or another, or stress in one form or another, um, is going to be linked into all the other reasons for the cycles, um, problems that I'm going to go through in this podcast. And this is because stress really is the inability to meet the demands of the body. Uh, but rather than just oversimplifying things and saying, like, it's just stress, I'm going to cover the other reasons for why it's causing a problem. So the next uh, reason or the next thing is a phenomenon known as the female athlete triad. And this is a group of three different symptoms that are commonly seen in female athletes. And they are symptom one, uh, an eating disorder such as anorexia and or bulimia or severe to moderate calorie restriction. And this can either be intentional or it can be unintentional. Uh, number two is amenorrhea, which is lack of menstruation, or oligomenorrhea, which is irregular periods. And then the third thing is osteoporosis or osteopenia. So that's the thinning of bones or low bone mineral density. So up to half of competitive female runners have menstrual irregularities and highly active girls reach puberty later than usual. So for example, there was one study where they were looking at 14-year-old girls and approximately 95% of the control subjects at 14 had started menstruating, whereas only 20% of gymnasts and 40% of runners had. And while the name would suggest that this is something that only happens to athletes, it's something I see is common with lots of women who do exercise. And with so many people's focus on aesthetics, the exercise that people uh, are doing can do changes um, that is very much about the body and not so much about creating health, and it can be pushing them further away from health. And everything in physiology follows the rule that too much can be just as bad as too little. And in practice, I see lots of women who are exercising excessive amounts or at least in excessive amounts in comparison to how much they are then eating. And exercise is a stress on the body, as I said earlier, um, but just because it's a stress doesn't mean it's inherently bad. Uh, but if you're not eating enough to match up with these extra demands from exercise and you keep this up consistently, then it can start to affect your cycles. And I would also expand on the term of exercise as well. Uh, this isn't just if someone is going to the gym. It could be someone who has a very physical job. So I live out in the country, so there's lots of horse stables and horse yards, and if someone is spending their days mucking out stables all day, pushing wheelbarrows, getting hay bales, working around the fields, this is a lot of physical work, uh, especially in the wintertime. So if someone is in this situation, they're, they're basically, in a sense, doing movement or exercise all day. Same thing if someone's job is, say, landscape gardening. Uh, there's probably other, other jobs that, that fit that bill as well. So I know these don't really fall under the bracket of what the female athlete triad is really about, but I do think that the same principles apply. So lots of physical exercise with not enough food can lead to problems with your cycle and problems with your bones, among other things. And the problem or the people who are most affected by the female athlete triad are those with low body fat. Sure, I think too much exercise for anyone can have an impact on um, a woman's cycle, uh, but it's typically those with a low body fat where it gets the stage where they're skipping cycles there or their period's not showing up at all. So I now want to break down some of the components of the female athlete triad because 
on their own, they can cause a problem. So low body weight or fat percentage is then the next issue. And I know I've kind of covered this already when talking about the female athlete tribe, but it can easily be a problem on its own, even without excessive amounts of exercise. So on average, it's estimated that for women, anywhere around 17 to 18% body fat is where problems become more likely. And as that percentage goes down, the likelihood then increases. And this doesn't mean that you can't have a body fat percentage of 15% as a woman and still get your periods. Uh, It just means that you're more likely to have problems. And while we are constantly told about the fact that everyone is overweight or is obese, this is not the people who I'm regularly seeing in my practice. I do see people who would fall into this category, but a lot of the time I'm seeing women who are much more thin, uh, much thinner than this and are, are on the other end of the scale. And sure, most women and most of these women, regardless of their weight, they still want to be losing weight. Um, But it's normally for purely vanity reasons rather than that the extra weight is because of their health. So they're women who are a UK size 12, but they want to be an 8 or a 10. And this would be, say, someone who in the US is a size 8, but they want to be a 6 or a 4. And they're typically people who are already in a healthy weight range, and I use healthy weight range in inverted commas, uh, but are still getting lots of symptoms. And they're just trying to lower their weight or um, either trying to lower their weight because they think it will help even more or they're trying to lower their weight for other reasons. And for a lot of these women who then become clients who are on that lower end of the scale, um, getting irregular periods or no periods at all When we then get them, or I suggest that they're eating more and they start to put on weight, the simple act of them increasing their weight and their body fat percentages brings back their periods or relieves a lot of their symptoms. And so just reinstating some of that weight can in of itself start to uh, help with those symptoms. And I will also add that it's not always just about body fat percentage or what the body fat percentage is, but where your body is used to sitting. So our bodies have an internal thermostat of where we're, where they're kind of happy to keep us and will typically fight pretty hard to keep us there. So someone, for example, could have a body fat percentage of 35%. They then go on a restricted diet that's not really supportive for their health. They're cutting calories. Um, they then, through that process, they manage to get their body fat percentage down to, say, 25%. At this range, in theory, they shouldn't be having problems with their cycle or it shouldn't have stopped. But for the body and where it currently wants to be, it's much lower and it will want to defend against further weight loss and attempt to get the body back to where it was previously and where it felt comfortable. And one of the ways the body can do this is by conserving the energy and shutting down or minimizing non-essential functions like reproduction. So in this situation, someone could get issues with their cycle that would normally be associated with someone with very low body fat simply because of how the body views the weight change that they've just done. So the next reason for issues with a woman's cycle is under eating. And I'm going to break this down into two different sections. So there's under eating in general or under eating of specific macros, which I'll cover in a second. So under eating in general sense should be pretty obvious by now. When you're not taking in enough, the body has to turn on more stress hormones and focus more on safety and security instead of procreation. So not enough food equals the body diverting resources from reproduction. And this can lead to periods ceasing to irregular periods and lots of different symptoms during and leading up to a cycle. And this can be intentional with someone going on a diet or taking it even further and getting a full-blown eating disorder, or it can be unintentional with someone trying to be healthy and eating lots of salads or raw or steamed vegetables and doing lots of juicing, and they don't think that they're under eating and that are not really trying to. They're just eating foods that they believe are healthy, and these foods um, happen to be very low in calories. So the next cause with the under eating is looking at the different macros. So macros is short for macronutrients and refers to carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. So in the world of dieting, one of these macros is normally being demonized. 
So this follows a cyclical pattern and things come in and out of fashion. If we go back to the 1910s, 1920s, protein was the enemy. We were told to keep it low if we wanted to remain healthy. And this is when the Kellogg cereal company started up and was partly in response to this fear around protein. More recently, in the 1980s, 1990s, fat became the enemy. So fat-free products became the rage and everyone was trying to keep their fat low. Then from the 2000s onwards, carbs has now become the enemy. The popularity of the Atkins kind of kicked this off and then other low-carb diets started up and more recently the paleo community in a lot of ways have been flying the low-carbs a bad flag. And give it another 10 years and things will change and maybe protein will become the bad guy again and we'll feel so silly for trying to avoid carbs that we're doing at the moment. Honestly, none of the macronutrients are inherently bad. None of them single-handedly cause poor health. All of them can cause problems when they're in too high or too low amounts, just like basically everything else to do with health or within life. So while most diet books create some kind of villain and get you to avoid it, I'd prefer to go for less sensationalist tactics and let you know that they're all fine for human consumption and should be eaten to provide good health. So what I want to do is look at how having low amounts of each of these macros can create a problem with your cycle or with your period. And let me just say that none of this stuff is set in stone. There are people can, who can eat a very low fat or a very low carb diet and have no problems with their cycle. And if that is you, then great. Uh, but if you are intentionally keeping these things low and you're getting problems, maybe it's something worth changing to see if it helps. So starting with carbohydrates, carbohydrates are your body's preferred energy source. This is energy so that you can think and run, but also energy to run your various systems, including your reproductive system. Keeping carbohydrates too low means that the body has to use more fat and protein as an energy source. To convert fat and protein into energy in decent amounts is actually part of the stress response, and it's an adaptive mechanism. So when you're doing this continuously, it means the body is in a constant state of low-grade stress. And as I talked about earlier, you want to be doing things that are shutting off stress, not perpetuating it, because otherwise it will hamper your ability to have cycles and ovulate. So carbohydrates are also incredibly important for liver function. The liver in detoxification has a huge impact on hormones. The liver breaks down most of the reproductive hormones, so it's important for regulating hormones at different points in your cycle. If you aren't taking in adequate carbohydrates, then the liver doesn't have the sufficient energy to be able to do this. So while low-carb diets are the craze these days, for most they aren't very good from a reproductive perspective. The next macronutrient is protein. And of all the women I see with problems with their period, a large percentage of them have been past vegans or vegetarians. And even when this isn't the case, regularly it's people who are suffering with hormonal issues and they're eating a low protein diet and often doing it unintentionally. So when protein is broken down, it's broken down into amino acids. And these amino acids are used for every system, organ, transaction within the body. Basically, everything in the body is protein dependent. So when protein is too low, uh, it has a very far-reaching impact. And there are two things that I want to focus on in relation to protein and reproduction. The first is that protein is one of the, the raw materials uh, that is used to create hormones. So if you're not taking in enough protein, there's not enough to create your reproductive hormones in the first place. The second relates to detoxification and liver function. When your liver is detoxifying, it needs certain substances for this to happen. One of the most important of these is protein and more specifically uh, certain amino acids. And when it doesn't have these, then hormone levels can get out of balance and the liver isn't able to perform its normal uh, regulatory functions. And this is something that can then link into a phenomenon known as estrogen dominance. And this is because protein and the liver are so important for breaking down estrogen. And when this isn't happening, it can increase in proportion to other hormones and other hormones like progesterone. So estrogen and progesterone should be in a good ratio of one another. And when there's a low protein intake and poor liver function, this ratio can get out. So if you're eating a low tea, a protein diet, and, and often this is, is unintentional, uh, it can be having an impact on someone's cycles. And this is something I've worked a lot on with, with clients, and it is a very common reason for, for problems. 
the final macro is fat. And fat is probably the macro that has been most maligned of all of them. Uh, while carbs, they say, is taking a pretty bad bashing currently, it doesn't really compare to the all-out assault that fat's taken for probably the last couple of decades. And fat is crucial for your cycle because it's so important for hormone production. So I mentioned that protein is part of the raw materials that hormones are made from. Well, fat is the same. So when fat is too low, there's not enough to make the basic building blocks for those hormones. Uh, Fats also used to regulate sex hormones. They are needed for the production of uh, hormone-like substances that help with hormone amounts and with hormone signaling. And fats are also needed for the absorption and utilization of fat-soluble vitamins, and they are vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin K, and vitamin E. And these vitamins are all incredibly important for reproduction. So just like carbs and protein, a low-fat diet can have a devastating effect on the menstrual cycle. And while the normal dietary practice is to blame one of these macros for all of your problems and tell you just to keep them low, this isn't true and they, they all have their role to play and can be important. And someone having a poor diet is probably a separate category for why or how problems can arise. And so maybe they are taking in enough calories. Um, Maybe they're not even restricting any of the macros, but their diet isn't really supporting them. And this could be because they're eating poor quality food and so they're missing out on certain vitamins and minerals. It could be how they're structuring their eating. So what's going on with their meal timings? Maybe they're trying to do intermittent fasting, but that just doesn't work for them. Um, It could be even following a diet that on paper is good and actually works for lots of people, but it's just not appropriate for that individual or for you. And I could spend a whole podcast on this, but I'm going to save that for another day. But what I will say is that food quality can be really important, even if someone is eating enough calories. And looking at the structuring and the pattern with eating is equally important. And I've actually covered a lot of that um, in a previous podcast that I did on keeping a food log. So if it's of interest to you, then I recommend you check it out. Um, I'll put a link to it in the show notes, uh, which you can find at www.seven-health.com forward slash 25. So the next potential cause for issues with a woman's cycle is being overweight. And in some cases, I think this is due to the weight itself. And this means having someone lose weight by whatever means will repair the problem. But honestly, this is normally when someone's weight is very high. An issue with this, I would say, is also that improvements only stay if the weight stays off long term. And the way that most people diet and attempt to lose weight leads to the weight being regained later on, and often with some extra for good measure. So while being overweight and in of itself can cause a problem, you need to then be looking at ways that someone can keep that weight off long term, if it is even possible. But most of the time, I think that being overweight is just correlated with the problem, but isn't actually the cause. Um, In this case, someone is overweight, um, they may be more likely to be getting problems with their cycle, but it's not the weight itself that's causing it. So there's a big thing in science about the difference between causation and correlation. So causation is A causes B. Correlation is where A and B happen together, but one doesn't necessarily cause the other. So if the problem isn't caused by weight, it's just correlated with it, then losing weight um, on its own will make very little difference. But if someone loses weight and it's lost in the right way because they're making changes that actually improve their health, then things will improve. Um, Or alternatively, the person could see improvements in their cycle uh, through changes to their diet and their lifestyle and exercise and all that stuff, even if their weight stays the same. And this is very common with clients that I work with. And I'm a big fan of the health at every size movement. You can be metabolically healthy while being overweight or obese, just as you can be unhealthy while keeping a normal body weight. And so much of the focus these days is on weight loss at all costs. And diets are evaluated on their ability to shed weight in the short term with very little uh, looking into or investigation on other factors. 
So if you are overweight and you think that this might be contributing to your period troubles, then first and foremost, the focus should be on improving health, improving habits, improving your metabolism, that side of things. Weight loss is rarely the magic solution that takes away someone's health problems, but it potentially can be if the changes that are made are also about improving health and not just about losing weight. The next reason for cycle issues relates to hormone production. And When I've talked about this kind of thing before, it's always been in a webinar or a presentation or a blog post where I could provide a visual aid. And being a podcast, I don't have any of that. So I'm going to do my best to explain things and hopefully you can visualize what I'm describing. So for hormone production, there are different steps that take place. And this is specifically for steroid hormone production. So you start at the top with a raw material, and from this raw material, you then create a hormone. And from this hormone, you then create further hormones um, that then can flow from it. So different hormones can be useful within their own right and act as as a hormone, but they can also be the raw material building blocks for a further hormone. So I want you to then imagine that there's a flow chart. At the top of that flow chart is the raw material, and from it, different hormones are created in a sequence or steps, and I'm going to walk you through it now. So at the top of the flow chart, the raw material for making these hormones is cholesterol. And I know most people consider that cholesterol is this, this uh, big bad thing that causes heart attacks and cardiovascular disease, but it is really important and has lots of beneficial roles within the body. And your body uses cholesterol to make all your steroid hormones, which include your different sex hormones. So the majority of cholesterol that is in the body is made in the body, and it's made in the liver as opposed to coming directly from diet. So when I said earlier on that you use proteins and fats to make different hormones, the first step in this is to create or use those proteins and fats to create cholesterol. So if there's a problem with a woman's cycle, then low cholesterol could be a problem, meaning that there isn't enough of the raw materials to start that first step, and so there can't be enough hormones flowing from it because there's not enough of that cholesterol. So next down that flow chart you have cholesterol being converted into a hormone called pregnenolone. And pregnenolone is the mother hormone that all of the rest um, of the steroid hormones then flow from. And this means it's really important that the body is able to convert cholesterol into pregnenolone so that that flow can happen. And for some people, this is where the problem lies. If the body's not able to produce enough of, of that pregnenolone, then the, the, the flow is not going to happen. And subsequently, women can get problems with their hormones and get problems with their cycle. So to make the conversion from cholesterol to pregnenolone, you need proper thyroid function. And it's specifically uh, T3, the thyroid hormone T3 that's important as part of that conversion. So the thyroid is the master gland that controls metabolism. It sits in the neck around the area of the Adam's apple. If it's not working properly, then that conversion is reduced. Uh, If you look back on historical medical books, testing for cholesterol was originally used to test for thyroid issues well before it was used to uh, diagnose cardiovascular disease. And if someone had high cholesterol, a low-functioning thyroid was then suspected. And I actually did a whole podcast recently on thyroid function, and I covered this in pretty good detail. Um, I actually got a ton of positive feedback about it from people, so I would highly suggest checking it out. Again, I'm going to link to it in, in the show notes. So apart from just T3, you need adequate amounts of vitamin A and copper to make that conversion from cholesterol to pregnenolone. So if this, is, if this isn't happening, then there isn't going to be enough of that raw materials, that uh, mother hormone to create the rest of the sex hormones. And so in this situation, you could have a case where there is high cholesterol or normal levels of, of cholesterol, but you'll have low amounts of pregnenolone. So from pregnenolone, hormones can go in a couple of different directions. Um, One direction is towards a hormone or to be created into a hormone called progesterone. And from progesterone, it can then be further converted into different stress hormones like cortisol and cortisone. 
The other way is to use the pregnenolone to create a hormone called DHEA. And then from DHEA, the body converts this into a lot of the reproductive hormones, so things like estrogen and testosterone and other hormones. In an ideal world, people will produce the right amounts of each of these various hormones from pregnenolone. So you have the right amounts being shuttled off to make progesterone, to make DHEA, and then flowing on from there. Unfortunately, what happens all too regularly is that people have stressful lives. And whereas previously stress used to be a short-lived experience with a uh, body response that was about life and death, um, it's now turned on constantly. And as I keep saying, survival is paramount in comparison to a body's need to procreate. And this means that whatever pregnenolone is then being produced, um, the stress pathway just gets first dips. And in times of stress, the pregnenolone or a, a high amount of it is shuttled off to make cortisol and cortisone, uh, leaving limited amounts available to then use to make reproductive hormones. So hopefully this description of hormones was easy enough to follow. I hope I've, I've talked about it in a way that you could visualize it or, or understand it. But really at different stages along that chain of events of things being converted, problems can arise and each of these different problems can have a knock-on effect to a woman's cycle. So medication then is the next cause for problems with a woman's cycle. Medications like antidepressants, antipsychotics, and anti-inflammatory drugs can disrupt your cycle and cause you to skip periods or to have them more frequently. Uh, many of these drugs actually elevate a hormone called prolactin, and prolactin can actually block a number of other hormones and really disrupt reproductive hormones. Um, these drugs can also be an added burden to the liver, which can also be part of the problem. So as I mentioned earlier in the section about macros, the liver's incredibly important for hormone regulation. And if it's not able to keep up, then certain functions will be missed. And let me just clarify that by saying I am not a doctor and not for one minute and what I'm saying here is to come off medication and I want you to be really clear about that. All I'm saying is that if you are on these kinds of medications and you're having problems with your cycle, they could be partially responsible for why that is. And contraceptive medication obviously also affects your cycle but that's their intention. But contraceptive medication can also come with side effects and lead to, to other symptoms as well. So lifestyle factors is then the next potential cause. Uh, your day-to-day -day life can have an impact on your cycles. Um, I've already mentioned exercise and the problems it can cause when people are doing too high amounts of it for what they're giving back to their body in terms of food. There are countless factors that could come under the, the bracket of lifestyle factors, but I want to touch on just three of them, and they are alcohol, smoking, and recreational drugs. So starting with alcohol, uh, alcohol, even in quantities that don't cause liver damage or damage to other organs, can cause irregular menstrual cycles. Uh, there's really no magic amount that if you cross, you start seeing problems. The amount will differ from person to person. Uh, but if you are having problems with your cycle, I would start to look at how much are you drinking. And if you are regularly participating in binge drinking, then it might be useful to have a break or at least uh, start to see that that could be part of the problem. Um, smoking. Um, smoking both depletes and increases the body's need for certain vitamins and minerals. And these include B vitamins, particularly B5, B6, B9 and B12, vitamin C, vitamin E, selenium and magnesium. And lots of these are needed for healthy reproduction, um, not to forget the impact that they or the, the need for, for, for liver function as well. So if these are being used up and depleted with smoking, there's less to go around. And so it makes it more likely there's going to be issues with reproduction as well as other issues. And with smokers, they have a greater chance of not ovulating. Um, often with a shorter follicular stage, which is the first half of the stage of uh, the cycle, um, smokers have an increased risk of um, shorter luteal phase as well. So that's a shorter second half of the cycle. And while this may sound like smoking is also always going to lead uh, to shorter cycles, if someone isn't ovulating, um, cycles can be much longer or they can be much more irregular. And Obviously, the amount that someone smokes is going to make a difference. So someone smoking one or two cigarettes a day is going to be a very different uh, impact than someone smoking 20 or 30 a day. 
But if you're a smoker and you're having problems with your cycle, it could be a contributing factor. Uh, An interesting side note, if you are trying to quit smoking, uh, research suggests that smokers have a difficult time quitting during uh, their period or during the luteal phase of their cycle, which is the second half of the cycle. So if you are wanting to quit, the first half of your cycle after your period is finished is statistically the best time to start. Um, Recreational drugs can also have an impact on period length. Uh, for some clients, recreational drug use is actually a pretty regular facet of their life. It's something they're doing every month, sometimes more regularly than that. Uh, for others, it's very occasional. It might be if they go to a summer mu- music festival or something of that nature, uh, while for, for lots of clients, it's just not something that they do. And recreational drugs can have an impact on vitamin and mineral status as well as liver functions um, or liver function. Uh, sometimes the problem I'd say isn't necessarily the drugs per se, but the other situations that the drug taking cause. So for example, someone may stay up all night, which means they miss out on sleep. And this means that that has an impact on their circadian rhythm. This also means that they may be sleeping a lot of the next day. Drugs can also have an impact in terms of Uh, how much someone eats with the tendency for them to be eating less if they're having things like cocaine or MDMA or eating increased amounts if they're having things like marijuana. So it's often these other factors that can have just as much of an impact as the drugs themselves, especially if someone's using them uh, fairly frequently. And I don't want this to sound like an after-school special and people can choose to do whatever they want with their lives and they can live their lives the way that they see fit. Uh, But if you are using recreational drugs or drinking alcohol or smoking, and this is something that is fairly regular, um, it's possibly going to be contributing to issues you're getting with your cycle. The next potential cause for issues um, is to do with shift work. And this probably fits under the bracket of lifestyle, um, but I wanted to mention it separately. Um, While we have the ability to have 24-hour light and stay up all night, this is not how we evolved. Our bodies follow a circadian rhythm, which is a 24-hour cycle for when hormones are naturally high or naturally low and certain functions are turned on or off depending on the time of the day. And this circadian rhythm is based on the light and dark cycles and the cycles of the moon and the sun and as woo-woo and as hippie-ish as that sounds. And unfortunately, shift work disrupts this circadian rhythm. So a study of 119,000 women found that those working evenings and nights had a 33% higher risk of menstrual problems with irregular periods and fluctuations in how long they lasted. And the more your work schedule fluctuates, the more likely you are to experience problematic periods. So one uh, one study found that women who worked rotating shifts were 23% more likely to have very short cycles, so that's less than 21 days, or very long cycles, so that's 40 days or more. And while the focus here is on shift work, really anything that disrupts regular sleep patterns can be causing an issue. As much as possible, we want to be following the natural rhythms of the sun and the moon and with our sleeping. And anything that messes with this um, too much um, is going to be having a negative impact. Something like shift work may not be the easiest thing for someone to change. If you are a nurse or you're a flight attendant, it's not so easy to just stop working shifts without having to leave that job. And what I would say is that it's rare that any one of these causes creates problems with your cycle single-handedly. And if you're working shifts, it will mean that you're probably starting from a more difficult place and you may have more things that you have to do on top in comparison to someone else. But there's no reason that it isn't achievable. And if you are a shift worker, I don't want you thinking like, oh my God, I need to be leaving my job. Uh, but it is going to be having an impact or it is more likely it's going to have an impact. And I'd also add to this that I think that it might not be the shift work per se a lot of the time, but other impacts that it has. So in a similar vein to the comments I just made about recreational drugs, someone who is doing shift work uh, may be getting less sleep. Maybe they have a longer periods between their meals or have more erratic eating. Maybe they eat unhealthier food. Maybe they do less exercise. And I, I'm just speculating on all of these. I'm not saying that this is definitely the case, but it could be affecting these other areas of, of life. And this is how the impact 
or the or a lot of the impact is is playing out. It's not just the circadian rhythm. It's all these other things. So the next area is specific illnesses that can be having an impact on your cycle. And this can be things like polycystic ovary syndrome or endometriosis or fibroids or a thyroid condition, diabetes, eating disorders, um, advanced liver disease and different sexually transmitted diseases. And all of these diseases are going to have different symptom profiles. So there's nothing I can specifically say to look out for, but it might be worth keeping a record of your various symptoms and then seeing if it matches up with any diseases. And if so, then go to a doctor, go get stuff checked out, go get some tests done. And I just mentioned polycystic ovary syndrome and endometriosis. And again, this is something I've previously done a podcast on. And if you are getting problems with your cycle, I would really suggest checking it out. Um, Again, I'll link to it in the show notes. And the link is www.7 spelt out hyphen uh, health.com forward slash 25. So that's www.seven hyphen health.com forward slash 25. The next cause of period problems can be things in the environment. So, uh, environmental or occupational toxins. So xeno hormones, also called xenobiotics, are synthetic chemicals that have a homo, uh, hormonal influence on all living creatures. Uh, they are very pervasive in our environment and they're disrupting hormonal health. And working in jobs where you're exposed to xenohormones uh, can have a huge impact on the body. And these kinds of jobs include uh, automotive manufacturing and repair, uh, paint and nail polish or varnish, uh, the electronics industry, the industrial cleaning, uh, metal part degreasing, dry cleaning, uh, glues and fiberglass, uh, fingernail polish and remover, carpet laying, farming with petrochemicals derived from pesticides and herbicides and fungicides. And the majority of xenohormones are estrogenic in effect, meaning that they have a similar effect to estrogen in the body, but their impact is often much stronger. And it's not just xenohormones, it can be real hormones in the environment. For example, because so many women are having or have been using hormonal contraceptives for so many years, this stuff is then peed out as part of normal detoxification. <clears throat> it makes its way into um, our water supply and back into our taps, and now we're drinking those hormones as part of our drinking water. And I know that sometimes hearing this kind of stuff makes people want to vow to only eat organic food, to never use cosmetics, to want to do liver cleanses, to rid themselves of this stuff, or to get all their water from some untouched well. And I don't think this panic is warranted. In a lot of situations, there's literally no way you can avoid this stuff. The people who are most grossly, greatly affected are probably, and and the ones who probably should worry more, are those who are exposed to the staff in their day-to-day jobs. So the jobs that I went through at the start, uh, they're going to be exposed in much higher amounts and exorbing in much higher concentrations, and they're going to be more likely to have problems. Uh, I have created and included a handout in the show notes that includes a list of endocrine disruptors and where they appear. And endocrine means hormones, so hormone disruptors. And if this is something that you want to focus on, uh, this will show you things that you can stop using in your everyday life or at least starting to find alternative forms um, or alternative products that don't contain these certain chemicals. So the final reason for problems with um, someone's cycle can be due to their constitution. So your constitution is that mixture of things that you've inherited and those that you've acquired through life, uh, particularly dietary and lifestyle factors from the first couple of years of your life. So sometimes there may be a specific cause that you can find. For example, there may be something uh, constitutionally wrong with a particular gland in the body. So for example, the pituitary. So the pituitary is located in the brain and produces a number of hormones. So hormones like follicle-stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, prolactin. Uh, If there is something wrong with this organ, you can be either deficient in these hormones or you can be producing them in excessive amounts. And in practice, what I would say is I find that people have constitutional weaknesses, things that even at a very young age were a problem or have been a problem for a very long time for them. 
So for example, even in good health, they will have very sensitive digestion and are more likely to have problems with this. Or there's someone who has a much weaker immune system and they're so much more susceptible for getting coughs and colds or the flu. And the opposite of this is also true, that people have constitutional strengths, systems that no matter how bad things get, they are unaffected. So you have heroin addicts who are able to have four or five kids where there's someone who's health conscious and does all the right things, but they struggle to conceive. And I really think it's useful to recognize constitutional strengths and weaknesses that you have because it can help you be realistic about things. If you've always had problems with your cycle in good times and bad, maybe this is going to be a weaker area for you. This isn't to say you can't greatly improve it or even get to a point where it's causing no symptoms at all. But when life gets tough or things go wrong, it's likely that this weakness is going to be the area where problems are first noticed. And so it's important to realize where um, you have these weaknesses and these strengths. So if things do go awry, awry, you have some context to it. So that's the factors that can affect your cycle, or at least some of the main ones. And if you struggle or if you struggle with your cycle for one reason or another, um, have a think about your current life and your situation and think about all the things that I've gone through and where do you think this could be causing a problem? What are the, the one or the multiple things that could be more likely to be causing an issue? And this is something I work on a lot with clients and the clients seek me out to, to get help with. And I know often when people think about working on fertility, it's from a place of wanting to conceive. And and while I do uh, work with clients to help with conception, a lot of the time it's women who simply want to have more regular periods or less pain or other symptoms or their period just has gone MIA and they want help to have it return. As I mentioned at the start of the podcast, I'm currently taking on clients and if what I've gone through in this show has resonated with you or sounds like something you want to get help with, then get in contact. So you can go to www.seven-health.com forward slash help and you can have a read about how I work with people, my costs, etc. and get in contact for that free initial chat. It's totally obligation free and we can see if we're a good fit for one another. So that's it for this week's show. Uh, I hope you found it useful and helpful. I'll join you next Thursday when I'll be back uh, chatting with another guest. Uh, Until then, take care of yourself and have a good week. Thanks for listening to Real Health Radio. If you are interested in more details, you can find them at the 7 Health website. That's www.7seven-health.com.